The song will be based on knowing work with Neil Turok and Harvey Real at Cambridge. has always been interested in what might be called alternative cosmology. He pushed the idea that topological defects like cosmic strings or textures were the origin of the large-scale structure of the universe. And he was a proponent of what is called open inflation. This is the idea that the universe is infinitely large and of low density, despite having been through a period of exponential expansion in the very early stages. My opinion was that these were all nice ideas, but that nature probably hadn't chosen to use any of them. I included open inflation in that list because I believe strongly that the universe came into being at a finite size, and I felt that implied that the universe now was still a finite size or close. However, after Neil gave a seminar on open inflation in Cambridge, we got talking. We realized it was possible for the universe to come into existence at a finite size, but nevertheless be either a finite for an infinitely large universe now. My talk will be about this idea and new developments that have occurred in the last few weeks. Neil and I realized that if there was a four-form gate field, one could invoke and drop the arguments to make it cancel the cosmological constant that one would expect from symmetry breaking. But the anthropic argument would not require it to cancel exactly. So there could be a small residual cosmological constant. This is exciting, because recent observations I will describe suggest both that the universe is open and that it has a small cosmological constant. As you probably know, the universe is remarkably isotropic on a large scale. That is to say, it looks the same in all directions if one goes beyond such local irregularities as the Milky Way and the local group of galaxies. By far the most accurate measurement of the isotropy of the universe is a faint background of microwave radiation first discovered in 1965. At the present time at least, the universe is transparent to microwaves in directions out of the plane of our galaxy. Thus a microwave background must have propagated to us from distances of the order of the Hubble radius or greater. It should therefore give a sensitive measurement of any anisotropy in the universe. The remarkable fact is that the microwave background is the same in every direction to a high degree of accuracy. It wasn't until 1982 that differences between different directions were detected at the level of one part in a thousand, with the dipole pattern on the sky. However, this would be interpreted as a consequence of our galaxy's motion through the universe, which blue shifted the microwave radiation in one direction, and red shifted it in the opposite direction. It need not represent any intrinsic anisotropy in the universe. 
It was not until 1992 that tiny fluctuations on angular scales of 10 degrees were detected by the Cosmic Background Explorer satellite, Kabi. Since then, similar fluctuations have been found on smaller angular scales. The shape of the spectrum of fluctuations against angular scale is still rather uncertain, but it is clear that the general size of the departure from uniformity is only one part in ten of the five. This uniformity of the microwave background in different directions was very difficult to understand. It seems the microwave background is the last remnant of the radiation that filled the hot early universe. What we observe would have propagated freely to us from a time of last scattering when the universe was a thousandth of the size now. But according to the accepted hot Big Bang theory, the radiation coming from directions on the sky more than a degree apart would be coming from regions of the early universe that hadn't been in communication since the Big Bang. It was therefore truly remarkable that the microwaves we observed in different directions are the same to one part in ten of the five. How did different regions in the early universe know to be at almost exactly the same temperature? It is a bit like standing in home work. If the whole class looks exactly the same, you can be sure they have communicated with each other. <laughs> but according to the hot Big Bang model, there wasn't time since the Big Bang for signals to get from one region to another. So how did all the regions come up with the same temperature for the microwaves? If we assume that the universe is roughly homogeneous and isotropic, it can be described by one of the Friedman-Robertson-Walker models. These are characterized by a scale factor S, which gives the distance between two neighboring points in the expanding universe. There are three kinds of Friedman model, according to the sign of K, the curvature of the surface is of constant time. If K equals plus one, the surfaces of constant time are three spheres, and the universe is closed in finite in space. If K equals minus one, the surfaces have negative curvature, like a saddle, and the universe is infinite in spatial extent. The third possibility, K equals zero, a spatially flat universe, is a measure zero, but it is an important limiting case. Because the universe is expanding, the scale factor, S, is increasing with time. The second derivative of S is given by the Einstein equation in terms of the energy density and pressure of matter in the universe and the cosmological constant, lambda. For the moment, I will take lambda to be zero. For normal matter, both the energy density and pressure will be positive. Thus the expansion of the universe will be slowing down. In particular, for a universe dominated by radiation, 
Like the early stages of the hot Big Bang model, the scale factor will go like T to the half. In such a model, one can ask how far one can see, before one sees right back to the Big Bang. It is easy to work out that this is just the integral of 1 over the scale factor. For the hot Big Bang model, this integral converges. This means that a point in an early hot Big Bang universe could have communicated only with a small region around it. Why then did it have almost exactly the same temperature as regions far away? A possible explanation was provided by the theory of inflation, which was put forward independently in the Soviet Union and the West around 1980. The idea was to make regions able to communicate by changing the expansion of the early universe so that S double dot was positive rather than negative. In other words, so that the expansion of the universe was being accelerated rather than slowed down by gravity. As you can see from the Einstein equations, such accelerating expansion, or inflation, as it was called, required either negative energy, or negative pressure. One gets in a lot of trouble if one allows negative energy. One would get runaway creation of particle pairs, one with positive energy, and the other with negative. But there is no reason to rule out negative pressure. That is just tension, which is a very common condition in the modern world. The original idea for inflation was that in some way the universe got trapped in what was called a false vacuum state. A false vacuum state is a Lorentz invariant metastable state that has more energy than the true vacuum, which is taken to have zero energy density. Because the false vacuum is Lorentz invariant, its energy momentum tensor must be proportional to the metric. Since the false vacuum has positive energy density, the coefficient of proportionality must be negative. This means that the pressure in the false vacuum is minus the energy density. The Einstein equations then imply that the scale factor increases exponentially with time. In such a universe, the integral of 1 over the scale factor diverges as 1 goes back in time. This means that different regions in the early universe could have communicated with each other and come to equilibrium at a common state, explaining why the microwaves look the same in different directions. The original model of inflation, which came to be known as old inflation, had various problems. How did the universe get into a false vacuum state in the first place, and how did it get out again? Various modifications were proposed that went under the names of new inflation, or extended inflation. I won't describe them, because I had gone into trouble in the past about who should have credit for what, and because I now consider them irrelevant. 
As Linda first pointed out, it is not necessary for the universe to be in a false vacuum to get inflation. A scalar field with a potential E will have the energy momentum tensor shown on the screen. If the field is nearly constant in a region, the gradient terms will be small, and the energy momentum tensor will be minus half E times the metric. This is just what one needs for inflation. In the false vacuum case, the scalar field sits in the local minimum of the potential, D. In that case, the field equation allows the scalar field to remain constant in space and time. If the scalar field is not at a local minimum, it cannot remain constant in time even if it is initially constant in space. However, Linda pointed out that if the potential is not too steep, the expansion of the universe will slow down the rate at which the field rolls down the potential to the minimum. The gradient terms in the energy momentum tensor will remain small and the scale factor will increase almost exponentially. One can get inflation with any reasonable potential E, even if it didn't have local minima corresponding to false vacua. The work that you and I have done is a logical extension of Andrew's idea. But I'm not sure if Andrew agrees with it, though I think he's coming round. <laughs> Andrew's idea removed the need to believe that the universe began in the fall vacuum. However, one still needed to explain why the field should have been nearly constant over a region with a value that was not at the minimum of the potential. To do this, one has to have a theory of the initial conditions of the universe. There are three main candidates. They are the so-called three Big Bang scenario, the tunneling hypothesis, and the no-boundary proposal. In my opinion, the three Big Bang scenario is misguided and without predictive power. And I feel the tunneling hypothesis is either not well defined or gives the wrong answers. But then I'm biased, for it was Jim Hartle and I that were responsible for the no boundary proposal. The set at the quantum state of the universe is defined by a Euclidean path integral over compact matrix without boundary. One can picture these matrix as being like the surface of the Earth with degrees of latitude playing the role of imaginary time. One starts at the North Pole with the universe as a single point. As one goes south, the spatial size of the universe increases like the lengths of the circles of latitude. The spatial size of the universe reaches a maximum size at the equator and then shrinks again to a point at the south pole. Of course, space-time is four-dimensional, not two-dimensional, like the surface of the Earth, but the idea is much the same. I shall go through it in detail, because it is basic to the work I'm going to describe. 
the symbol is compact four-dimensional metric that might represent the universe. It's a force sphere. One can give this metric in terms of coordinates, sigma, t, eta, and phi. One can think of sigma as an imaginary time coordinate, a t, eta, and phi as coordinates on a free sphere that represents the spatial size of the universe. Again, one starts at the North Pole, sigma equals zero, with a universe of zero spatial size, and expands up to a maximum size at the equator, sigma equals pi, over two h. But we live in a universe with a Lorentzian metric, like Minkowski space, not a Euclidean, positive definite metric. One therefore has to analytically continue the Euclidean metrics used in the path integral for the no-boundary proposal. There are several ways one can analytically continue the metric of the four sphere to a Lorentzian space-time metric. The most obvious is to follow the Euclidean time variable, sigma, from the North Pole to the equator, and then go in the imaginary sigma direction, and call that real Lorentzian time, t. Instead of the size of the three spheres going as a sine of h sigma, they now go as a cos of h t. This gives a closed universe that expands exponentially with real time. At late times, the expansion will change from being exponential to being slowed down by matter in the normal way. The departure of the scale factor from a cost behavior will occur because the original Euclidean force sphere was not perfectly round. But the universe would still be closed, however deformed the force sphere. For nearly 15 years, I believe that the no-boundary proposal predicted that the universe was spatially closed. I also believe that the cosmological constant was zero, because it seemed unreasonable to suppose that it was less than the observational limit of 10 to the minus 120 Planck units, unless it were exactly zero. But the Einstein equations relate the energy density in the universe, plus lambda, to the rate of expansion, and the curvature, k, of the surfaces of constant time. Define omega matter and omega lambda to be the density in lambda divided by the critical value. If the universe is closed, that is, k equals plus 1, omega matter plus omega lambda must be greater than 1. Observations of luminous matter, like stars and gas clouds, give an omega matter of about 0.02. We know that galaxies and clusters of galaxies must contain non-luminous or dark matter, but the best estimate of this is that it contributes at most 0.2 of the critical density. Still, Eddington once said, if your theory doesn't agree with the observations, don't worry. The observations are probably wrong. <laughs> but if your theory doesn't agree with the second law of thermodynamics, forget it. <laughs> I 
certainly believed in the no boundaries were closed, and I thought it implied that the universe had to be closed. Since the closed universe is not incompatible with the second law of thermodynamics, I was sure the observers had missed something, and there really was enough matter to close the universe. I didn't take the seriously the possibility of a small cosmological constant. <coughs> the observations do not yet indicate that the universe is definitely open, or that lambda is non-zero, but it is beginning to look like one or the other, if not both. I won't go through all the observations, but shall just show what I consider to be the most significant pieces of evidence. The first is a distribution of large-scale infomotoneities in the universe. On the very largest scales, this can be measured by fluctuations in the microwave background and on smaller scales like the galaxy-galaxy correlation function. One can then try and fit these observations with the predictions of inflationary theory. If one assumes the universe is filled with cold dark matter, the predicted spectrum of irregularities depends on the quantity gamma. This is a product of omega matter with the Hubble constant, or rate of expansion, in units of 100 kilometers per second, per megaparsec. Astronomers use funny units. <laughs> it is generally believed that the Hubble constant is somewhere between 50 and 100 of those funny units. Thus, if omega matter is 1, gamma must be at least 0 0.5. As you can see, a gamma of 0 0.5 would predict much less irregularity on large angles than is observed. One can get a reasonable fit of the observations with a gamma of 0 0.2. If omega matter were 1, this would imply a Hubble constant of only 20. As a theorist, I would be happy with such a figure, because it would make the universe older, and remove the possible conflict with the ages of some stars. But the observers claim the Hubble constant has to be in the range 50 to 100. This would imply that omega matter is at most 0 0.4. Thus dynamical measurements give us a vertical strip in the omega matter, omega lambda plane. One can obtain further limits in this way from observations of supernova. Type 1 supernova are standard candles. That is, the total energy in the explosion is always the same within the factor close to 1. One can thus use their observed brightness as a distance measurement and compare it with their red shifts. This gives the limit shown on the diagram for which I'm grateful to Ned Wright and Sean Carroll. The yellow, red and green ellipses represent the formal errors, and the large pink area under possible errors. 
also shown in blue are the limits set by the position of the peak in the angular spectrum of the variations of the microwave background. As you can see, the observations suggest that the universe is close at the open close device, but with a non-zero lambda. Despite these indications of the low density lambda universe, I continue to believe that the cosmological constant was zero, and the no boundary proposal implies that the universe must be closed. Then in conversations with Neil Turok, I realized there was another way of looking at the no boundary universe that made it appear open. One starts with the point that Andrew Linda made, that inflation doesn't need a false vacuum, a local minimum of the potential. But if the scalar field is not at a stationary point of the potential, then it cannot be constant on an instant, a Euclidean solution of the field equations. In turn, this implies that the instanton can't be a perfectly round floor sphere. A perfectly round floor sphere would have the symmetry group O5. But with a non-constant scalar field, the largest symmetry group that an instanton can have is O4. In other words, the instanton is a deformed floor sphere. One can write the metric of an O for instanton in terms of a function B of sigma. Here B is the radius of the free sphere of constant distance sigma from the north pole of the instanton. The instanton were a perfectly round floor sphere, B would be a sine function of sigma. It would have one zero at the north pole and a second at the south pole, which would also be a regular point of the geometry. However, if the scalar field at the north pole is not at a stationary point of the potential, it will be almost constant over most of the four sphere, but will divert near the south pole. This behavior is independent of the precise shape of the potential. The non-constant scalar field will cause the instant not to be a perfectly round four sphere, and in fact there will be a singularity at the south pole but it will be a very mild singularity and the Euclidean action of the instanton will be finite. This Euclidean instanton has been described as a universe beginning at sub p. In fact, a p is quite a good image for a deformed sphere. Its size of a few thousand blank lengths makes it a very petty flaw. <laughs> but the mass of the matter it contains is about half a gram, which is about right for a T. I actually discovered this T in Stanton in 1983, but I thought it could describe the birth of those universes only. To get a closed universe, one starts with sigma equals zero at the north pole and proceeds to the equator, or rather the value of sigma at which the radius, b, of the three sphere is maximum. One then analytically continues sigma in the imaginary direction as Lorentzian time.
as I described earlier, the skid that goes unitus with the scale factor that initially goes like cos t. The scalar field will have a small imaginary part, but that can be corrected by giving the initial value of the scalar field at the north pole, a small imaginary part. According to the no boundary proposal, the relative probability of such a closed universe is e to minus y the action of the part of the t instanton between the North Pole and the equator. Notice that as this part doesn't contain the singularity at the South Pole, there is no ambiguity about the action of the singular metric. The action of this part of the instanton is negative, and is more negative, the bigger the t. Thus the probability of the t is bigger, the bigger the t. It is this is that Andrew Linda finds so counterintuitive. He therefore proposed that the probability should be e to the plus y z action rather than e to minus y z action. But one can't divide the action of the universe into a background part and a fluctuation part. If you change the sign of the action in the exponential, you also change fluctuations from being suppressed to being enhanced, and being enhanced more, the better they are. There is no way the positive sign in the exponential could lead to a smooth universe with small fluctuations. The negative sign may look counterintuitive, but it leads to physically reasonable consequences. As I said, I thought the no boundary proposal implied that the universe had to be spatially closed and finite in size. But a few months ago, Neil Turok and I were talking about this idea of an open inflation. We realized that they could be fitted in with the no boundary proposal. The universe would still be closed and finite is one way of looking at it. But in another, it would appear open and infinite. Let's go back to the matrix for the T instanton and analytically continue it in a different way. As before, one analytically continues a Euclidean radical coordinate in the imaginary direction to become a Lorentzian time T. The difference is that one goes in the imaginary sigma direction at the North Pole rather than the equator. One also continues a coordinate C in the imaginary direction as a coordinate psi. The state is a free sphere into a hyperbolic space. One therefore gets an exponentially expanding open universe. One can think of this open universe as a bubble in a closed, desitter-like universe. In this way, it is similar to the single bubble inflationary universes that have been proposed by a number of authors. The difference is, the previous models all require carefully adjusted potentials with false vacuum local minima. But the T instanton will work for any reasonable potential. The price one pays for a general potential is the singularity at the South Pole. 
In the analytically continued Lorentzian space-time, the singularity would be kind like a naked. One might think that this naked singularity would mean one couldn't evaluate the action of the instanton or of perturbations about it. This would mean that one couldn't predict the quantum fluctuations or what would happen in the universe. However, the singularity at the South Pole, the stalk of the key, is so mild that the actions of the instanton and the perturbations around it are well defined. This means one can determine the relative probabilities of the instanton and the perturbations around it. The action of the instanton itself is negative, but the effect of perturbations around the instanton is to increase the action, that is, to make the action less negative. According to the no boundary proposal, the probability of a field configuration is z to minus its action. Thus perturbations around the instanton have the lower probability than the imperturbed background. This means that quantum fluctuations are suppressed, the bigger the fluctuation, as one would hope. On the other hand, according to the tunneling hypothesis, favored by the Langen and Linda, probabilities are proportional to E to the plus action. This would mean that quantum fluctuation would be enhanced, the bigger the fluctuation. There is no way this could lead to a sensible description of the universe. Linda therefore proposes to take E to the plus action for the probability of the background universe, but E to the minus action for the perturbations. However, there is no invariant way in which one can divide the action into a background part and a part due to fluctuations. So Linda's proposal does not seem well defined in general. By contrast, the no boundary proposal is well defined. Its predictions may be surprising, but they are not obviously wrong. To recapitulate. A general potential, without false vacuums or local minimums, leads to the key instanton. This can be analytically continued to either an open or a closed universe. The no boundary proposal then allows one to calculate the relative probabilities of different backgrounds and the quantum fluctuations about them. There is not a single key instanton, but a whole family of them labeled by different values of the scalar field at the North Pole. The higher the value of the potential at the North Pole, the smaller the instanton, and the less negative the value of the action. Thus a no boundary proposal predicts that large instantons are more probable than small ones. This is a problem because large instantons will lead to a shorter period of exponential expansion or inflation than small ones. In the closed universe case, a short period of inflation would mean the universe would re-collapse before it reached the present size and density. On the other hand, an open universe with a short period of inflation 
who have become almost empty early on. Clearly, the universe we live in didn't collapse early on or become almost empty. So we had to take account of the anthropic principle that if the universe hadn't been suitable for our existence, we wouldn't be asking why it is, the way it is. Many physicists don't like the anthropic principle, but I think some version of it is essential in quantum cosmology. M theory, or whatever the ultimate theory is, seems to allow a very large number of possible solutions and complexifications. One has to have some criterion for discarding most of them. Otherwise, why isn't the universe 11 dimensional in cozy space? The approach Neil Torak and I took was to invoke the weakest version of the anthropic principle. We adopted base statistics. In this, one starts with an a priori probability distribution and then modifies it in light of one's knowledge of the system. In this case, we took the a priori distribution to be the e to the minus action, predicted by the no boundary proposal. We then modified it by the probability that the model contained galaxies, which are presumably a necessary condition for the existence of intelligent observers. An open universe has an infinite spatial volume. Thus a total number of galaxies in an open universe would always be infinite, no matter how low the probability of finding a galaxy in a given commuting volume. One therefore cannot weigh the a priori probability given by the no boundary proposal by the total number of galaxies in the universe. Instead, we waited by the commuting density of galaxies predicted from the growth of quantum fluctuations about the T in Stanton. This gives a modified probability distribution for omega, the present density, divided by the critical density. For the open models, this probability distribution is sharply peaked at an omega of about 0.01. This is lower than is compatible with the observations, but it is not such a bad miss. As far as I'm aware, this is the first attempt to predict the value of omega for an open universe, rather than fine-tune the false vacuum potential to obtain a value in the range indicated by observation. The anthropic arguments we have used are fairly crude and could be refined. But the best hope of getting a more realistic omega seems to be to include other fields. Eleven-dimensional supergravity, which is the best candidate we have for a theory of everything, has a three-form potential with a four-form field strength. When dimensionally reduced to four dimensions, this can act as a cosmological constant. For a real four form in dimensions, the contribution to the cosmological constant is negative. It can therefore cancel the positive contribution to the cosmological constant 
and must arise because supersymmetry is broken in the universe we live in. Indeed, supersymmetry breaking is necessary condition for life. But galaxies will not, galaxies will not form unless a total cosmological constant is almost zero. Thus the anthropic principle fixes the value of the four form field strength, which is a free parameter of the theory, so it almost cancels the positive contribution from symmetry breaking. But it need not cancel it exactly. The anthropic requirement can probably be satisfied by any omega lambda between about minus 1.5 and plus 1.5 with a fairly flat probability distribution. This is consistent with the observations. My student, Harvey Riala and I are now working on an 11-dimensional supergravity version of the key in Stanton. One gets a reduced action in four dimensions with the four form and two scalar fields, which describe the size and the squashing of the seven sphere. The squashing scalar field, phi, has a potential with a minimum at the round metric and a maximum at the squashed sphere with an Einstein metric. One can get a P in Stanton by starting phi on the exponential wall on the right. This would produce an inflationary universe in which the squashing ran down at the round seven sphere. The scalar field that represents the size of the seven sphere has a potential that looks unstable. However, if one takes into account the back reaction of the scalar field on the four form, the effective potential becomes stable. There is a possible quantum tunneling instability through the potential barrier that separates the round seven sphere from highly squashed spheres. In a supersymmetric candy D sitter for space, one could apply a written type positive mass argument and rule out such an instability. But in our case, we are supposing that supersymmetric is broken and that the positive cosmological constant so generated cancels out the effect of the four form to give the universe at its almost flat locally. Such a broken symmetric universe would be unstable to decay through the formation of bubbles. But I estimate the bubble formation probability to be of the order of e to the minus 10 to 30. So I don't think we need worry. If this model works out, we may understand the origin of the universe in terms of fundamental theory. Assuming that one can find a model that predicts a reasonable omega, how can we test it by observation? The best way is by observing the spectrum of fluctuations in the microwave background. This is a very clean measurement of the quantum fluctuations about the initial instanton. Three 
previous treatment of open inflation has had to be rather hand waving about fluctuations. But with the fee standard and the no boundary proposal, it should be possible to calculate the spectrum in detail. One can then compare it to the new observations that will be coming in soon from the MAP satellite in 2001 and the Planck satellite in 2006. To give you an idea what one might expect, I show simulations of the microwave background, the low density universes. The differences are obvious at the naked eye. But with careful analysis, it would be possible in principle to determine the shape of the instanton. Thus a no-boundary proposal and the key instanton are real science. They can be falsified by observation. Thank you.
If Omega Lambda were greater than 2, there wouldn't have been a Big Bang. We have good evidence for a Big Bang.